Hello and welcome to the Gross Profit Podcast. I'm your host, James Kennedy, CEO at ProcurementExpress.com. We take the hassle out of managing your company's purchasing with magical features. Uh, and today I'm excited to invite Dan Hackett uh, from Executive Pro Tem, who's and we're going to discuss together fractional CFOs, what they're what they are why you might need them and what they can do for you. So Dan, thanks very much for coming on to the podcast. How are you today? I'm doing great, James. Thanks for having me. Great. So just before we get started, for people who aren't aware of you already, maybe you could just give us a little rundown of who you are and what you do as a fractional CFO. Sure. So I come at it from a little different perspective than others in that while many CFOs are also CPAs and have served as maybe controllers and um, and CFOs in other positions, I've also run a company and I've also spent quite a bit of time in pure management accounting. So in terms of helping with uh, strategy and accountability and just helping small and medium-sized business owners run their business better. So my approach uh, tends to be a bit wider than others in that um, many owners think they need a fractional CFO to fix their accounting, but the real value comes in far more than that. Yeah, okay, great. Well, let's, let's, let's assume nothing here and let's start with the basics. So mm-hmm. what would you say is the difference between an accountant you know, a CFO, a controller, what? Yeah, it, the, the, the difference is in perspective. So an accountant is, of course, purely transactional and, um, and really has um, a very limited set of skills for analysis. Controller is, um, is a bit wider perspective but controllers still are focused on historical, what happens, what happened, did we get it right? Is it accurately recorded? The CFO is the position that needs to look forward. They'll accept the historical financials as the baseline, but the right CFO helps the business owner make better decisions by understanding what has happened and having some confidence to project what might happen into the future. Okay. So in the worst case scenario, an accountant is the coroner who told you why you, maybe why you died six months ago. As a, uh, and what I'm hearing here is you're kind of the fitness coach who's going to keep you healthy and keep you out of the morgue. Uh, very much, the very much a coach, very, very much uh, focused on looking forward rather than backward. Mm. Okay. That's interesting because, it's quite relevant to us at Procurement Express now here. Like we've had an accountant, obviously he's great, Billy. Hi, Billy. He's really doing great work for us. And he does our accounts, management accounts every month, out by the 10th of each month. Um, mm-hmm. But then as we've grown, we found it like uh, it's more when, when it comes to at the beginning, you can get away without much budgeting. Let's, let's face it, like it's survival. You know, yes. just if you survived, then it was a good month. If you didn't, <laughs> if you didn't, then it was a bad month. But as you grow... You start, you know, the, the the time frame that I analyze seems to grow as well. I used to just think, okay, let's make payroll. And when payroll's doing, you're getting that done after a while, you start to think of, oh, what's going to happen in quarters? And then after a while, you start to think of it in years, you know, and you think, well, how is this thing going to be around? Maybe it's because I have kids now, I think in years instead of months. Sure. But um, so that it's much more far- forward looking is from what I heard. Now, when are the telltale signs that, you might need this help in looking forward or a fractional CFO. What are the problems that are currently, you know, might be cropping up for a typical business owner? Yeah, you know, often the first sign is an owner doesn't have a lot of confidence in the financial statements that he's receiving. It could be an issue of timeliness. It could be an issue of accuracy, but the owner just doesn't feel like he or she has a handle on even what happened before we even get to uh, what should happen. Um, th- the other the other scenario, though, is high growth companies. Um, what what many people don't understand until you're in that position is that high growth can cause a business to fail much faster than a slow growth business. 
The challenge is you will out you will outrun your cash, put yourself into a borrowing position, and not a lot of people want to borrow at these rates today. So often we come in as a fractional CFO to fix things, but the fixing is is only a very small part of it. We need to we need to fix what needs to be fixed and then start looking forward very quickly. Yeah, I think the, I was looking at a angel investor forum I was part of this week, and the number two reason for startup failure is cash flow. Like, yes. i.e., in their case, they didn't raise money fast enough, or just mismanaging the money that they what they had, you know, um, or getting the most out of it, if you like. And that board looking part is tricky. I, only half an hour ago, I was having a debate about whether we should sponsor a conference, and we're trying to figure out what the budget is, and where it's the end of the year, and. You know, it's really not easy. Forecasting is difficult. So what are your go-to moves uh, when you are brought in? What are the things that you would, how would you create impact? Or what do you look at as a first move to create impact in a business that you work with? Well, the, the first that you, you have to do is address the owner's pain. And so if the owner's pain is either accurate or not timely financial statements, that needs to be rectified you know immediately and that's as much for the owner's benefit as as my own benefit but i very quickly move into an observation and analysis of the accounting or the finance department generally what happens in many businesses is that the 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 department could have three or four people and these are these are trusted people they've often been around a long time but they're also treated as that department behind the green curtain. They No one really understands what they do. Well, the impact could come with really drilling down into processes. It could be internal controls, but I, I tend to focus more just on process, meaning often these, these finance departments are using the same processes they've used for 10 or 15 years. And while I don't come in with the idea that we need to change the headcount, if we really get good at the process and understand all the tools that are available, maybe you can get the same or better results with fewer people. Hmm. And I guess that's often, uh, especially in that scenario you mentioned, you've been working with you know a team for 15 years. They're obviously professionals. If you're working in the accounting department, you're trusted and professional and skilled hmm. and I can get that, uh, you know, the executive often thought it is the green curtain. I like that analogy because it's a, a little bit of a black art. You think, oh, well, this should be simple enough, but throw in a few accruals and a few, you know, deferred income statements. And oh, next sure. thing you're like, I, you're, it's, it's, it's really hard. So, I mean, how do you approach that um, from, uh, because it, it can be, you know, we all look for efficiencies, but like, how do you approach making it obvious that maybe, you, you know, to right size the accounting team. Um, what's your strategy for, for doing the change management there? My approach is very much collaborative. So the one of the first tools that I use is a, some people think it's simple, but um, it's a SWOT analysis of the finance department. And I have, and but I lead that analysis with the department. I want them to come to the conclusions as to what is holding them back and what their opportunities are. Nine times out of 10, or I should say 95 times out of 100, we still find unclear roles and responsibilities. And that becomes my opportunity to really clarify who owns what. Once that's finished, then, then you start to take a look at, well, who should own which process? But until you get that clarity, it's really very difficult because you find yourself not understanding what the real source of truth is. Everyone has opinions and we have to drill down to the facts. And it's it's common for me to, to lead this SWAT session and remind everyone that facts win, facts win. Mm -hmm not stories. And and it takes a long time. But when you do it collaboratively, you gain trust. And once you gain trust, people are more willing to open up to you. And those processes, give me an example. Would that be like accounts payable or would it be far more fine-grained than that? Or 
No, it, it could be as it could be as simple as accounts payable, and you could uh, it could be accounts payable to payroll because again we we tend I tend to work with small and medium sized businesses so everyone has multiple roles, and what you what you can often find is um, in accounts payable is that something went wrong six years ago and we added three layers of approval and we've never changed. And so bills bills get paid late. People are touching the same invoices three, four times. And honestly, most of the time they're waiting for the owner to approve. So part of that discussion as the outside outside professional is to talk to the owner about where do you really need to approve invoices and where can you just trust your team to to mm -hmm. do it and we often you know you just set a typically just set a dollar amount mm. yeah i mean i lit up there when you said that because i see it oftentimes there's a problem and we go to well let's look at the process what what was broken in the process and we layer in some process there and that happens two or three times and mm -hmm. next thing you've got this behemoth uh, which is very hard to get anything done and it, you know from my world i see it in in software engineering where you know you're you want to fix something in the product but then you decide well it has to get tested by someone first it's got to be reviewed by someone else first you got to have a product manager looking at it. next thing you get to a situation where just changing the color of a button requires like 20 people to look at it and it takes six months and right. you know that's that's a pain i've felt and it sounds similar there, like it's just too, uh, I guess the, what, what I've learned in that is, yeah, sometimes it's the process. Sometimes it's the people, like you have to look, you have to get the balance and right. Sometimes people have a bad day. Sometimes people might be in the wrong seat in the worst worst scenario, mm -hmm. I guess. But you can't just say, add more process, add more process, because that's not always the right answer. No, it's, and it's often an overreaction. However, those overreactions tend to come from the owner when we're dealing with cash. So it's completely mm -hmm. understandable, but uh, often again, it, it takes maybe that outside perspective to say, you know, I understand what happened three or four years ago, but we have, we have other internal controls to ensure that your cash is safe. Let's get moving. Otherwise your cost is say, you you have one additional person that's a real there's a real cost to that and mm. that ten that then 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 they really tend to get on board a little bit with process yeah well we, we might cut this out but it reminds me of the joke about the the granddaughter who goes to her mom says how do you cook a ham for christmas <laughs> and the mom says you cut the end off and you put it in the oven you put it for three hours and you take it out and the daughter says that's great why do you cut the end off? And she says, I don't know. Ask your grand, ask your my my mother. And she goes to the mother, same thing, same, same answer. She says, Why do you cut the end off? She says, well, I don't know. Ask your great grandmother. So she goes to her and she asks her, Why did you cut the end off the ham before you cook it, great grandmother? And she says, Well, it won't fit in my oven if I don't do that. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> And so, you, you know, in, in this the, this accounting department, because many have been around for so long, they know all the stories. They mm -hmm. are they are the historians, and they can often tell you why things are dysfunctional in another department because they because they were around to see it. Hmm. Yeah. No, it's it's interesting, and um, I also like the idea of. Um, when you're, if, if your accounts are used properly, it can be a lot more powerful in the business. I think certainly we start off, you just want to pay the taxes and stay out of jail. Sure. Uh, but then as you scale, you realize, well, actually, like the first thing I came to was like, okay, well, let's look at our sales reps and how are they're comped. And then once you do that, you realize, oh, they have targets and budgets, but then that's only half the story. Then you suddenly start to realize that actually that thing called budgeting or forecasting that you were just ignoring is the whole plan for the business. It's the instantiation of what you want to do with your business. Mm -hmm. um, but but getting the forecasting or budgeting is notoriously difficult. Like it's notoriously difficult to make it accurate because it's almost wrong as soon as you write it. Yes. Uh, 
And then it's, and then I've seen this, like, you know, you, you start off with your budget, you think, oh, this is going to be beautiful. I see the city on the hill of where we're going and this is fantastic. Two months in, you're like, no, oh, the wheels have come off. And everyone, and we've started update, updating that spreadsheet because it's just too embarrassing to, right. to admit anymore. Right. What, do you have any uh, tips for getting that right? Like, because uh, you need that foresight, but it's notoriously difficult to keep it up to date and keep face with it. It seems like a lot of work. Yeah. You, it is important. You need to put that stake in the ground so that everyone understands what they're going towards. The challenge, the, the challenge, of course, for an owner, and I see where the CFO can add tremendous value is in that sales forecast. Too many times we listen to the owner and the salespeople, and what what they have done is taken last year's plus a shot of courage plus 10, 20 percent. It really depends upon how the owner's feeling that day, whether they want to go to 10 percent or 20 percent. Yeah. The, what the 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 CFO's role is to take that number, but then drill down, and mm-hmm. understand the drivers that are that result in that sales number, and when you have the CFO just working with sales, often often it should be done without without the owner to drill down on the drivers to that generate the sales. So. We really just break it down quarterly, then monthly, weekly, if necessary, into all of the component parts. So how many meetings is that? How many calls in that is that, depending upon the business? The CFO then becomes instrumental in creating those smaller KPIs Mm. because we all get comfortable with the big KPIs, but we miss the smaller KPIs that add up to the larger KPI. And that is that is the CFO's uh, gold, really. If if they are truly going to be a partner in the business. Mm-hmm. Well, what you said there really illustrates, I guess, the difference. Like uh, your accountant would never, my accountant would never step out and start setting goals for salespeople. But I can see now that someone on the executive is. I mean. CFO and then this this title chief revenue officer like it's closer or even COO is starting to get into that as well that you can see the yeah. two coming together. Yeah, I, I think in, in in an organization with those three, the starting point is not the revenue number. The starting point is, in 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 my view, our margin. Do we agree <laughs> that the margin will hold or Are there things going on in the outside world that really cause us to think through the margin? Because if, if obviously, if we're having issues in cost of sales, that uh, has a direct impact on the revenue. And I think the CFO can play an instrumental role in that rather than, again, take last year plus a shot of courage. You just, you just need to drill down and, and understand all of the components. So if you've gone ahead and you've started to work with a fractional CFO, mm-hmm. like uh, three three to six months in, how do you know you've made a good hire? What would a good C- fractional CFO have done in that time? The, the owner understands where cash is and where cash is expected to be. Mm-hmm. And the owner is spending less time thinking about finances and more time asking questions of the CFO. And ideally in three to six months, the CFO should be the one having conversations with the banker versus the owner. Something that happens, and I I don't know that I can explain it, but I've I've explained it to many owners, is, is that we can take the financial statements and of course, they're not audited. Uh, they're 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 really prepared in house. But if if you're discussing lending with a banker, the conversation between the banker and the CFO is a better conversation than between the banker and the owner. And it does not suggest that the owner is 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 not telling the truth or anything like that. But the CFO is able to drill down underneath the numbers and explain 
to the banker in a better way why the numbers, uh, why he can ha he or she can have confidence in those numbers. Right, they speak the same language. So they speak your, your prototypical language. CEO might be for fire and brimstone and you know <laughs> fuzzy pictures and uh, you know a logical guy like me just can't deal with that. You're like, well, well, tell me exactly, show me on the spreadsheet. Where's how's this going to work? You know. Yeah, and so many small and medium-sized business owners uh, come from the sales and marketing side, and yeah. they they almost can't help themselves but to explain to a banker or anyone that everything gets cured with sales. Yeah. Well, yeah, that that's not how we repay loans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I I'd, I'd admit you know sales does feel like it solves everything sometimes, but um, <laughs> it feels I get like the. It. It feels like it. Yeah. Well, it's a bit like being, I think sometimes it's owning a small business, like being a stock trader. When the sales are up, everything smells like roses. Yes. And then when you miss a sale, everything is in, you know, so it plays and you're it's far more emotional than black and white. Yes. So, so the big, uh, I mean, the big trend you asked about asking questions there that brought to mind to, you know, AI, do you think you're, your job is going to, I'm going to be able to plug in an AI to my QuickBooks anytime soon and I won't need a, a CFO anymore. I can just ask the fuzzy questions and get the answers. Or how do you think AI is going to, is it going to impact or is it all just hot air? I think it will impact the accounting and finance profession. Um, the initial impact will be transactional. Uh, all of the, all of the disparate software packages that that companies have will, will likely work together better and i can easily envision a scenario where that allows the finance department to shrink by one person or or two people but that's on the transactional level that could be almost bookkeeping or or clerk related when it hmm. comes to analysis I think we're we're quite a bit off, and the, the the reason is I can I can suppose I could feed AI um, monthly balance sheets or P and L for the past three years and ask its opinion, but it it can't process the culture of the company. It can't process the owner's hopes and dreams. Um, it probably won't take into account the current lending environment. And mm -hmm. it certainly couldn't consider whether the sales team is effective or we're about to make a change. There are so many of the soft factors that have to be accounted for. A AI would do a great job of telling me what the ratios are and the bank would like that, but that doesn't, that tells 25% of the story. Yeah, I think it was a bit of a shock to the system when I came out six months ago now at the time of recording. And then we're starting to realize well, the applications are still unknown, especially in my job where we're all programmers and we were told, yes. oh no, here we go. We're going to be gone. But no, turns out, turns out you need to know someone. Yes, you still need someone to tell someone, tell the computer what to do, even if they're doing more of it, you know? So I, I, I think that's right. And in such a dynamic environment, particularly in, in the small and medium sized business world, relationships still matter for everything. You can ask the salespeople that, or you can ask you know, the individuals in the company that, and you can ask the bankers that as well. Relationships still matter. And I, I think we're quite a ways off before uh, AI figuring out that part of the equation. Yeah. So listen, Dan, that's all time we have time for today. Thanks very much for coming along. How can people get in touch with you or find out more, reach out to you? Yeah, the the, the easiest is the website, fractionalcfoplus.com. Um, probably even easier is LinkedIn. So it's you know linkedin.com slash in slash Dan Hackett. I was on there early and um, I'm on there frequently. So Happy to answer any questions that uh, that your listeners have. Great. Uh, I know that's how we connected. So there you go. Mm -hmm. LinkedIn works, I guess. Uh, it does. So. Well, thank you very much for listening. Uh, next week, we're going to be interviewing uh, ESG, that's Environmental and Social Growth Expert, here, based out of here in Dublin, Ireland. We're going to be talking about the new European legislation when it comes to managing your carbon footprint with your SMB. But until then, we'll see you next time. 
Great. Thank you, James. Thanks, Tom.